Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Lieutenant General Bob Shea, United States Marine Corps retired, President and Chief Executive Officer of AFSIA International. Well, thank you everyone, and uh, if you're not done eating, please go ahead and, and, and carry on. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to uh, take a moment to recognize uh, several volunteers for long-standing support and their service to West. Admiral John Bepko, the United States Navy retired, has served as a registration volunteer manager for 10 years and is a long-standing member of the Naval Institute. Uh, as we go through this, he's uh, the 2019, this, this event that we're conducting right here this week, marks the 17th consecutive West for him. Additionally, volunteers Neil Cadwaller, Terry McInerney, Alice Tanya, and Yaz Tanya have been, been integral to the success of this event in West. I would now ask them to all stand and be recognized for their commitment to West, and please join me in welcoming them with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Well, now I've got the opportunity, and it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable James Hondo Gertz. Uh, secretary Gertz was sworn in 5 December as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition. As the Navy's acquisition executive, he's got oversight <coughs> of an annual budget over $60 billion. He previously served as the executive United, uh, acquisition executive for the United States Special Operations Command. At SOCOM, he was recognized for innovative leadership and his technical ingenuity, which delivered rapid and affordable acquisition. And he served as a mentor and a great role model for all those who were in the acquisition community. Prior to the senior executive service, Secretary Gertz served in uniform as a career Air Force office. Officer. He was an acquisition uh, manager with engineering program management leadership positions in numerous weapon systems, including the intercontinental ballistic missiles, surveillance platforms, tactical fighter aircraft, advanced avionics systems, stealth cruise missiles, training systems, and manned and unmanned special operations aircraft. He's got over 30 years of extensive joint acquisition experience and served in levels of acquisition and acquisition positions, including the acquisition executive, program executive officer, program manager of the defense acquisition system. And I know, I t I've cut into your time. <laughs> <laughs> this is acquisition Welcome. streamlining. Thanks, Bob. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? All right, fired up. So, uh, so it's great to be back here. I uh, came here last year. Uh, just shortly after getting confirmed, and uh, and so today I'd like to kind of discuss, you know, if you can come to these conferences and kind of get a little bit into everything is screwed up, and then it turns into a we're fixing to conference, uh, and then all we talk about is what we're fixing to do, not what we've actually done, and so I want to focus a little bit on what we've actually done, which I would say in the last year has been pretty remarkable, and I say we, that's big we. That's not just RDA staff, that's not just the government folks, that's not just the industry folks, uh, that's sailors out on the deck plates, that's Marines and foxholes, that's all of us here working together. Uh, because, you know, my kind of core theme is vectors are pointing in the right direction, we got to giddy up, right? And so our challenge now is how do we take the positive vectors uh, that we're all on, do it at scale, do it at speed, and do it at a pace that will completely dismay our enemies. And so I'll talk today a little bit about how we're going after that uh, and where I see us heading, uh, but focusing for a good part of this on what we've actually done, which I, which I believe is fairly remarkable. Uh, so I'm a positively discontent person. Uh, I, I'm fired up, uh, but I'm never satisfied. Right? And I don't think we can be satisfied. The nation is not looking for us to pat ourselves on the back and be satisfied and get complacent. Uh, so we should recognize what we're doing and, we, and move, our, move our way forward. Uh, the kind of opening slide here kind of speaks to that, right? 
right? What do we got here on the slide? We got Big Mo, right? Kind of the quintessential end product of America at the end of World War II. Four years to build, popped out. That's where we signed uh, the treaty at the World War II. Interesting, right? We, then we mothballed her, then brought her back, then mothballed her, then brought her back, then mothballed her and brought her. So a little bit of uh, you know, agility and innovation of taking something old and figuring out how to apply it to a new problem. In front of it, Sea Hunter. I'll get some money from Lidos for putting that up there. Thank you very much. Um, Lidos, right? Just did a trans uh, San Diego to Hawaii and back autonomous journey. A version of what some of the future might look like. And as we talk about it, I would don't concentrate all on one. We got to be just better versions of, we, of what we always were. Or all new, what we've done in the past is irrelevant. Uh, it's going to be our ability to blend both of those at speed and at rate that will be really, uh, really important. Now, it is funny as an acquisition guy doing this a little while, everybody thinks they can be an acquisition guy or gal. So Bob and Pete here, they wanted to practice acquisition. They said, I know we have been working all year on this new acquisition program called Great Weather. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to offer you, you know, besides a chance to get out of Washington, a chance to get some great weather. And I said, hey, you know, I'm, I used to live in California. It's rainy season. Nope. We got it all. We've been doing a tech demo. In fact, we're going to have a risk reduction exercise. Two weeks ago, I was out to commission a Michael Monsoor, beautiful San Diego, 90 degree day. So thanks for your acquisition failure. You have breached. We're going to have a nun McCurdy on the weather. Um, I also heard the under was out here yesterday. I uh, unfortunately didn't get to see his speech, but as a good, uh, good ASN, you want to see what your bosses are talking about. And I was going through the video, and I guess he did a drill of everybody who doesn't think acquisition are working well or doesn't have confidence, raise your hand. I have the video. <laughs> I know who raised her hand. Just kidding. All right, next slide. Um, if, you sh if you were here last year, you would have seen a very similar slide. I added two words in here, really on the first, but my priorities have been pretty consistent as we move through this. And so as we kind of talk about what's coming up, I'm going to focus a little bit on where we are, where we're going. The two words I added were actually to the first uh, kind of objective. I'm a delivery guy. I come from a long history of my job is to put tools in the hands of sailors and Marines and let them do their stuff. So if we aren't focused on delivering, we as an enterprise, we're not doing our job. Processes are good. They're, they're helpful. Um, but a process never killed anybody or let anybody do what's the nation's bidding. It helps us out, but it's not about the process. Um, I also talked about, you know, delivering is a combination of three kind of elements, how much stuff you have, what that stuff can do, and then how available is it. I added the and sustain here uh, because we have really got to focus as an enterprise on not just getting to the first delivery. Um, it's a great, great year for the Navy. I'm doing, I think, my fifth commissioning of a new warship on Saturday. We're going to do 13 new warship commissionings. That's pretty awesome. I mean, it's, we are building the Navy the nation needs. But if we can't sustain those affordably, operate them at the pace and at the rate that we need to, that's, just, that's a sugar high, and then we're going to really suffer. So my challenge and where we've been moving forward is think of not only delivery as the first product, but delivery every day consistently on the pier, on the ramp, moving forward. A lot of great activity going on there. Um, we'll focus some on agility. Uh, you've kind of heard the, uh, the CNO and, and the Undersecretary talk about uh, how do we get our learning pace up. Uh, that's critically important. I'll show you in a slide or two how, kind of how we're getting after that. Uh, and then affordability. And when I talk affordability, one, one piece I would just kind of foot stomp. It's not just dollars, right? It's time, it's skills, it's energy, right? 
And so as we figure out where to get waste out, scrape barnacles off the ship, right, we need to look at that all with a sense of urgency. And then finally, uh, I always love these because we get to recognize uh, sailors, folks at the deck plate, right? In the end, it's all about talent. Enabling talent, giving them the tools that they need to do, getting the talent into our acquisition enterprise. Go to the next slide for me, please. Um, kind of a state of the union for us is um, in 18, we did about $106 billion of contracts. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, we mentioned $60 billion in earlier. We're at about 250,000 contract actions. Um, small business folks out there, about $15 billion direct to small businesses to get our agility up. We competed about 40% of the work. Uh, we tripled over the last two years our use of other transactional authorities and some of these new contract mechanisms. Talked about ship deliveries and then uh, aircraft deliveries. And I didn't even bring in weapons and C4 and all that other stuff. Um, the real key in the transformation we've been under is mission focus. Not competency focus, not what badge are you wearing focus, not industry focus or smarter government focus. How can we all work together with a focus on the mission and compress the distance between deck plate industry, science and technology, and the acquisition folks, so everybody is bringing something to the table, right? And doing so in a way that, you know, my favorite far form of R&D, right, rip off and deploy, right? I'm not very smart, I'm a hell of a poacher, right? When we talk about this connecting and knowledge-based Navy, Department of the Navy, it's, we, we have a little bit of a history of relearning the same thing over and over and over. Uh, if we can connect up everybody with a mission focus, we'll get our pace up. Next one, if you could. So when I think about um, acceleration, and I just put, this was kind of my smattering of stuff, so if, if your stuff isn't on the slide, I'd, it's not that I don't love you, or if your stuff is on the slide, I don't really love you. Um, it's just a matter, but it's a pretty good kind of around the, uh, around the Department of the Navy. What have we actually done in a year. Kind of top center, LRASM. User said, hey, we're really, really worried about getting after enemy ships at distance. Right? Back to this rip off and deploy. Let's take an Air Force missile, let's put a Navy seeker on it, let's get it quickly into the fleet on a bomber, and after that we're going to quickly get it onto a Navy, a Navy platform. Years and hundreds of millions of dollars savings on that program alone hundreds of millions of dollars. Kind of off to the, uh, to the side, um, vessels of opportunity, right? How do we make it tough on our enemy if the only place we can do anti-submarine warfare is off of specialized anti-submarine platforms, we make it easy for the enemy. If we can put those systems on any vessel, now you got the enemy guessing. He's got dilemmas, right? We make it really, really tough on him. Right, accelerated acquisition. Take something we use somewhere else, take another asset we have, put them together, right? Interesting new combinations. Down at the bottom, last night just awarded our, uh, our large, extra large, unmanned underwater vehicles. Bottom center, first carrier unmanned uh, aviation platform stingray that's gonna go on a carrier. Execute that source selection exactly on time, save billions of dollars in the source selection, Moving that straight away. Then off on the other side, lasers. Right? How do I get magazine death? Again, create some dilemmas, uh, dilemmas for our enemies. And then kind of up the left-hand side, our Marine Corps guys love them. Right? How do we take existing uh, vehicles, add some guts on them, and now we can take care of uh, the, our UAV problem? And finally, up on the top corner is uh, some tremendous work the team has been doing on the digital uh, virtualization side. I see Admiral Barrett out there. I mean, really working at how do we get agility in software? 24 hours from compiling software to testing it, to getting it cyber certified, to getting it out to the fleet, uploaded on a combat ship. Right? 
How do we transform that awesome experiment into the way we do business? One of the ways we do that is create a whole virtual combat system. So kind of those boxes in the corner is an entire Aegis combat system. So imagine now on your ship, you've got your certified, tested, proven combat system, and on it you have two or three other versions that might be you know, the next test one. It might be something that's got a lot of sailor ads on it that you're gonna test out and, and kind of let you guys work it on the fleet. It may be the thing that connects all to all of our other ships so we can have AI talking across the fleet, yet be able to be very effective if we get disconnected. It could be all of those things and more. All of this was done in the last year. That's pretty freaking awesome, right? Now, is it hard? Yes. Could we do better? Absolutely. Are there inefficiencies we need to continue to root out? You betcha, right? But in a year, by decentralizing, empowering our workforce, giving them lots of tools, letting them connect all the way down at the user level, opening up the communication channels between us and industry so we can actually talk about how to build a better requirement as we're building it, all of that is really letting us accelerate as we move forward. All right, doing some awesome stuff. Um, better business models. I think the undersecretary may have made, you know, uh, two carrier deal. All right, we've decided we wanna buy two carriers. Let's figure out how to do it as cost effectively as can. Say four point change a uh, billion dollars, right? And what do we do? We're delivering the carriers at the same time. Uh, for the academics out there, on about an 82% learning curve, starting with the second ship. So yes, do we need to make sure our stuff is affordable? Absolutely. Taking 16% out from the first ship of man hours and then going on an 82% learning curve is how you drive out fundamental costs. That's what we all need to be focusing on as we get to agility, as we move forward. So that's kind of the state of where we're heading. Uh, again, I would say core for me is mission focus. It's all about the mission. Everybody comes with their own incentives, uh, what's interesting to them, what's motivating to them. But if we can link all that up, that would be really good. The last piece I would like to kind of put out there is where we've kind of, I'm standing up a little cell. If those who know me from SOCOM knew we kind of had this softworks kind of innovation cell. We're kicking off an effort, what I'm calling Naval X, Naval Expeditions, right? Expedition is an arduous task where you gotta bring technology and courage and uh, all your MacGyver skills, all that together in one place. What this really is is not as much of like a glitzy innovation store as much as a set of capabilities that anybody can access. So if you're a sailor out there and you've got a great idea and you wanna crowdsource something, what do I need from you? I need your idea. I don't need you to be the expert on how to crowdsource, write that contract, right? So if we can, with this Naval X, start putting a set of tools everybody can use efficiently, we'll get our agility up. Navy's got, and the Marine Corps, both got extraordinary innovation pockets at warfare centers and labs, uh, but they're not terribly well connected. So we tend to rediscover things and so if you're interested in doing counter UAS, you ought to be, be able to call Naval X and say, who else is doing that? Let me connect with them so we can move forward. So very light load. Uh, its main goal is really to help be that accelerant on agility. On the industry side, what that will look like is if you have an idea, I'm gonna make it easy for you to walk in one stop shop. You may not connect to the actual person you need to connect to, but we'll have some connectors in there. And so if it's at Admiral Becker's shop out at Naval Information Warfare Center Pacific, you don't have to go roll a dex, figure out who that is. You can get the Naval X guys, they'll say, yeah, I know, uh, you know, Sergeant Joe Bag of Donuts, he's a guy out there that's really working on it and it's a connect up. Again, what do we have to do? We have to achieve this at scale. We can't do it little one-off, cute little uh, kind of demo things. If we're gonna be relevant and compete and win, we've gotta do that at scale. That's where we're headed, that's what I'm interested in, that's what I think we can all bring to the table. All right?
My job is to make it as easy for us to bring all of our unique, diverse skills to the table and quit being caught hostage by change and actually move to make that our competitive advantage. Instead of reacting to all the surprises that come out every day, we should be able to take advantage of surprises. Instead of being worried about how fast technology is changing, we should be creating the system that can capture that faster than anybody else. And instead of having a very laborious bureaucratic process that becomes irrelevant to you at the deck plate, it ought to be all about you at the deck plate, right? That's where we're headed. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I think it's going to take for us to compete and win. I'm positively discontent. Got the right vector, right? Now we need to continue working it at scale. So with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions or happy to let everybody eat or uh, whatever you guys want to do. Thank you very much. Can't be so lucky as to get away without any questions. Ah, oh, darn. Should have moved faster. You knew I'd have a question for you. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Megan Eckstein, USNI News. I uh, wanted to follow up on the naval expeditions idea. Uh, mm -hmm. The Navy in the past has done several innovation portals and different things online to solicit ideas, but I wondered if you could elaborate on this idea of having a cell of connectors to connect the ideas and the doers. Kind of how does that work? What expertise will they have? And how do you really you know, make this work better than previous attempts? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I'm trying to resist the urge of Everybody has their little innovation cell, and then you put a couple people in it, and they work really hard, but then it becomes overcome by events. Uh, and so what it's really kind of first focus is connecting all the innovation things we've already got going on individually, but we don't have the leverage of the full organization. Second piece is really of a platform kind of mentality, right? So that we make it easy for anybody who's got an idea to push that idea forward. And so sometimes these innovation cells get a little bit um, self-focused, and then they want to be the ones with all the brilliant ideas. And it's kind of exactly the opposite. I don't want them to have any of the brilliant ideas. I want them to be able to take all the brilliant ideas that are sitting in this room and be able to push them forward efficiently. Um, because right now, if you've got a brilliant idea and you're out there and you want to do a prize challenge, that's, you know, it's almost impossible, or if it's even possible, it's bureaucratically taxing. So creating that kind of service platform is, is really important. And then the third piece is create, um, you know, back to the uh, CNO's high velocity learning or the undersecretary's agility and uh, kind of uh, his new education uh, piece. How do we get the knowledge transfer moving at rate? So I'll just put a shameless plug. If you haven't been in the back corner to see what the Marines are doing with battlefield 3D printing and stuff, anybody in industry, you know, that's a pretty awesome idea. But how do I connect that cell to other folks doing that? So if they need to go service a job, they, not everybody has to invent everything themselves. Uh, the key for this is light and, and picking people in this cell. And some of the ones we picked who are, I call them Sherpas. Their job is to help you on your journey. Their job's not to tell you how to do your journey, uh, but kind of connect it to everything. And then the final element of it, which I think will help, is just giving an outlet for folks who are doing great stuff to publicize that so other folks can see it and feed off those ideas. So think of an accelerant. Um, that's kind of the way we're approaching it, maybe differently than, hey, let me put up my new innovation cell. Because we had, a, in the Navy, I could count lots of them, but they were not terribly connected. Thanks. Sir, Mike Mann, I'm an old SWO and I'm um, very interested in the Flight 3D D DDG program. And, mm -hmm. You know, getting the SPY 6 to C is going to be a game, game changing capability. How are we doing on that program and we're going to deliver on time? Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, you know, that program in particular, doing well, just did a, a recent flight test. That radar is solid. That's moving us out. Um, but I want to do more than just how good is the next new radar. 
It's really how do we connect that now to this entire network and fleet. And so I'm sure you've had lots of good discussions already, more coming. All right, the challenge for the Naval Force, Navy, and Marine Corps is how do we get away from exquisitely capable single platforms to a, a fleet that operates in a distributed manner that can leverage all these great capabilities and play them together to create dilemmas for the enemy. And what's really interesting was pick the SPY-6 radar. All right, it's an awesome radar, and it's got a bunch of other awesome things you can do with a radar like that. If we can get our software speed up, kind of this 24-hour combat cycle, and you know, not have to wait for a year or two to process algorithms, that awesome foundation now becomes war winning, right? Because we can, we can outpace our enemy's ability to react to us. So it's a great, it is a foundational block, necessary, but we've got to do a whole lot more to leverage it. Thanks. Sir, Bill Hamblett, uh, Proceedings Magazine, Naval Institute. Uh, this morning we heard that uh, we're headed into a resource constrained environment. The national debt, service of the debt is uh, going to impact the department's budget. In times like that in the past, parochial interests, uh, you know, the, the marine requirement trumps, trumps the uh, Navy requirement, which trumps the Air Force requirement, and, and there's internecine warfare within the department. How do we avoid that? And is the environment within the building improving so that that's not happening? Uh, a year ago, the, the best quote I thought from West uh, 20. 18 was when General Neller said, I think we're going to need more submarines. Because right. he, he was talking about having to fight to get to the fight. The CNO almost hugged him on stage. Uh, but is that, is that changing, yeah. getting away from that parochial you know, sort of mindset? Sure. Um, I mean, I would be lying to say there's never going to be another parochial challenge. Even within the Navy, you could have the 75 different versions of the Navy fighting with each other sometimes. But here's the way I would approach things in a way I think we're trying to approach it. Um, whether it's the CNO, the Commandant, um, or the Secretary, or, or myself. Um, it's really interesting. If you want to look at some, um, I would say, fundamentally kind of different ways of thinking, looking at abundance thinking versus scarcity thinking. And when I, I would characterize the very parochial, I've got to protect my money from somebody else, as scarcity thinking. And if you look at, from my perspective, and, and I'm just a knuckle dragon, guy with an 18-inch neck, certainly not an academic. Um, but if you look at the times in our military where we've really had high velocity, um, I'll say, you could call it innovation or whatever, you might think of the Navy from like the 1880s to 1945. You might think of the Air Force from late 50s to early 80s. You might think of Special Operations Command from 05 to 06. And I think you had two things that were in common. Um, one thing you had in common was they didn't have a scarcity mindset, they had an abundance mindset. And so their mind was not, how do I get more? It's how do I make use of everything I've got? Even if that means I'm gonna get in a supported and supporting relationship where I don't have to own everything organically. And so again, if I go back to my special ops experience in 06 with General McChrystal, it was not about everything had to be SOCOM, it was how do we leverage everything towards a mission focus. So that kind of abundance thinking with a mission focus uh, was really important. And then the second piece is we valued uh, learning fast, whether it was through experimentation or through, through trying things on the battlefield or through academic pieces. Anytime you have that mindset of abundance, so it's not I'm gonna take from you so you don't have anything. We're gonna work together so between us one plus one is three. Right? Even if one of my ones is a half of you, um, and you had this drive with a mission focus to learn, experiment, have enough humility that not all your ideas were the best ones, right? And, and if you look, what's exciting for me in the Department of Navy is I think we're, in, we're kind of in that mode, abundance thinking. I could complain that we didn't have enough money for two carriers, or I could say, hey, we got some really smart guys in the industry, we got some smart guys in the government, we're gonna work together and figure out how to deliver more for less resources without it feeling like I took $4 billion away, right? Proactively drive at that. And then as you heard from the undersecretary or the secretary, I'm sure you'll hear from the CNO and Commandant, this we value people who learn, who experiment, who drive 
and are enthusiastic about change, not just be a better version of what we were yesterday, but really look after that. So I'm, I'm actually pretty excited if we can keep that mission focus, that focus on talent, that learning kind of experimenting talent, um, and keep an abundance kind of mindset. Um, I think, you know, it will be challenged and that's great, uh, but I'm not worried that it's gonna be, you know, kind of land warfare in between all the factions. If it goes down to that, then shame on us from a leadership perspective. Um, I just ask you at whatever place you are, deck plate, on the sea, in industry, to join us in that, right? So it's not an us versus them or ultimate winners, ultimate losers kind of piece. That's where we as a community can really, really push, right? That's where we can really make a difference. Sir. Hi, Tom Weatherall with General Dynamics NASCO. Um, leveraging off a couple of the previous questions with uh, multi-purpose platforms, budget constrained environments. Um, so the CHAMP uh, Industry Studies RFP is due tomorrow. And for those in the audience not familiar with that acronym, it stands for Common Hull Auxiliary Multi-Purpose Platform. Um, with that due tomorrow in industry studies starting, where do you see that program going, particularly in a budget constrained environment? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I'll, I'm gonna broaden it out a little bit and then uh, maybe hone in on that. Uh, what you've seen, again, when I say, what have we done in the last year, and, I, and certainly I don't wanna be the one taking credit, I'm just gonna, my, my dates time, time group started about a year ago in December. Um, we're really trying to fundamentally shift the way we interact with industry. We got to a place which was a bad place, from my perspective in the government, where we felt like we couldn't talk to industry because that would cause some problem in the acquisition world. And we actually caused more uh, problems for ourselves because we started writing requirements in vacuums. We started um, not getting new ideas from outside kind of our own ecosystem. And so with Frigate, with, with Champ, which you referenced, we're really trying to change our process to get a much more agile requirements process, which is much better informed by great ideas no matter where they come from, industry, everywhere else. And so, yeah, our kind of current initiation of CHAMP may not be affordable, which is we're gonna create our own kind of custom ships to go do things. So what are we doing? We're trying to interact with you guys in industry to bring all those good ideas to the table so we can figure out what the right options are to get capability faster, and affordably. Um, and the way we stood out on that program, you know, we've still got, that's why getting that um, kind of industry feedback is really important. You've seen us do the same thing on Frigate. Very active requirements versus cost versus capability trade with the user in the room. When the user is saying, here's what I value, and then us on the acquisition side, driving to create the right relationship so we can deliver that value as cost effectively as possible. All right. Do I get to leave now, or is this the mystery question? No, sir. I'm going to give you the softball to hit, though. Uh oh. So, Those are the most dangerous. how do you how do you balance speed on the acquisition side with supply chain security, particularly when you're working with a global supply chain? I just like to hear what your thoughts might be. Yeah, there. absolutely. And I'm. I'm gonna go maybe two different directions. I'm gonna pivot off that a little bit because um, I'm surprised we haven't had any real questions about repair or how do we improve our sustainment system, especially with a bunch of the FRC folks here, right? Some of that on the FRC side is, let's enable you guys and gals to go do what you need to do. We'll bring in some new concepts. Um, some of that is, again, a much more informed approach. I am looking for any and all ideas on how to continue to reduce the cost of readiness and sustainment. Um, some of that is better visibility on supply chain, ensuring you get the right parts uh, in the system. Uh, some of that is new ways of thinking about how we do repair. Some of that is how to better train our maintenance folks on these very complex pieces of gear we send out there. And some of it is having the right design thinking on the front end of programs to think about maintenance not deal with it just on the back end. Uh, I am very concerned about supply chain from two perspectives. Uh, and they both are security slash resilience. 
One is having enough stability in our programs that we can build a supply chain and keep that uh, moving. If you look at on the nuclear ship side of things, the number of suppliers we had 20 years ago or 30 years ago is about a tenth of the number we have now. So that means you don't have a lot of resilience. You have a lot of single part suppliers. Uh, if that, something happens to that factory or you lose a recipe or you need to double or triple your demand, you've got a lot of challenges. The second piece now is cyber uh, and really understanding, even if you have the supply chain and you have the parts and you know if they're the parts you need, do you understand what they are? If we can get the data visibility and the fluidity in our processes, um, I, I don't think the answer is let's take longer and slow down programs so we can spend more time studying the supply chain. I don't want to make, I don't, I don't want to make that a false trade. So I think that the trick for us now is how do we then, on these programs that are going faster, accelerate our learning and understanding of the supply chain, understanding how fast we can train. We don't spend enough time thinking about accelerating training. We, we kind of focus on the gear, and then we haven't trained the maintainers. We're giving them the, the tools they need. Uh, and then get enough efficiency in the supply chain that we can get it up and running much faster. That's the way I think you get around it. I don't want to get around it by slowing things down, but I also don't want to field stuff that's great for the first mission and then dead for the rest of the war. Uh, and we've got to balance our way through that. Awesome. Hey, thanks for your time, gang. Right? Walkaways, mission focus. We'll be good. Thanks, Bob. So I got the message the first time around. So I, want, I want to thank you very much for the support. Process the improvement. Candor, yeah, there, there we go. And certainly for the leadership that you're providing. And it's pretty clear when you look at gave you some of the examples, particularly with the two-carrier buy, that uh, we've got a gentleman up here who's thinking ahead and is going to uh, provide great benefit to the uh, Department of the Navy as we go forward. So on behalf of FCA and the Naval Institute, I'd like to present you with a token of our gratitude, a copy of the Learning War, um, and inside from the Naval Institute Press, inside you'll have a, a, a bookmark from FCA. So thank you very much awesome. for- Thanks very much. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Thank you.